What's going on, A Push Peeps? We have A Push Review Period 4 from 1800 to 1848 in 10 minutes. May take 12 or 15. I don't know. It's kind of a long one. I'll do my best to get it done in 10 minutes. You asked for it. You got it. You know what's going to be on the exam, so let's get going. All right, let's talk about increased democracy and government relationships. Let's start off first talking about the emergence of political parties, some that you should be familiar with. The Federalist versus the Democratic Republicans of the 1790s that really were born out of Hamilton's financial plan in the French Revolution. Know that Hamilton was the leader of the Federalists, Jefferson the leader of the Democratic Republicans, Hamilton tended to favor the wealthy, Jefferson the common man or the farmer. Then we have the second political party system, from the 1830s and 1850s, we had the Democrats versus the Whigs. The Democrats were predominantly led by Andrew Jackson, the Whigs, by my boy, Henry Clay. And here you see a picture from the 1844 election. Sadly, my boy lost. All right, the Supreme Court during this time increased the power of the federal government over states, and they did so through several core cases. McCulloch v. Maryland, which said that the Bank of the United States could not be taxed, that a federal agency is supreme over states, and also Worcester v. Georgia, in which they said that Native Americans cannot be forced to move out west. However, Andrew Jackson, as we know, disregarded that ruling. The growth of the market economy increased debates over the role of the government. And often during this time, it's very important to know, people were loyal to their region, not the nation. And we see this in the Embargo Act of 1807, in which people were smuggling in goods during the War of 1812, and they were has, they were resistant to it. Also, the nullification crisis of 1832 to 1833, in which South Carolina nullified some tariffs. So there's more of a devotion to the region than the nation. In the South, identified with and took pride in sl slavery. Be familiar with this term, positive good. They defended slavery as a positive good. All right, Second Great Awakening. This stressed the importance of achieving perfection. And you would see this religious movement, and people were... Thousands of people will go to these camps and experience religious conver conversions. The most important thing about the Second Great Awakening, which is specifically mentioned in the curriculum, is that it inspired many reforms. You see abolitionism, women's rights, especially the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, and temperance as well. Those three are the biggest reform movements. Now, African Americans' rights, both for free and slaves, were restricted during this time. You have various emancipation plans, such as the American Colonization Society, which was a gradual emancipation plan, and the goal was to send freed slaves back to Africa. And you see other forms of resistance to democracy. You have pro-slavery arguments against slavery as a positive good. So, you know, this idea of slavery really goes against the idea of democracy. So some ways to justify it was to argue that slavery was a positive good. You also saw a huge xenophobia during this time or nativism. This was incre This was intense hatred of foreigners. You saw the Know Nothing Party, the emergence of that, which was a very popular political party during this time, and the discrimination against Irish in particular. There's anti-black sentiments and culture, especially in minstrel shows in which white actors would don blackface and they would mock and, and play the stereotypical African-American roles. There were also restrictive anti-Indian policies. Talked about the removal of Indians earlier, and that's specifically a result of the Indian Removal Act, which led to the Trail of Tears. So we do see some new cultures during this time. Hudson River School dealt with landscape or environmental paintings. If you see anything about outdoors, or you're confused on what the Hudson River School is all about. I think of Hudson River, that is that is a river, that is a geographic feature. Guess what they drew? Geographic features, landscape features. John James Audubon contributed enormously to the study of birds and the environment. And we also see the emergence of religious groups and groups for women. So Shakers, they believed in sexual equality and celibacy. Mormons were led by this dude, Brigham Young, to move to Utah to seek religious refuge. And in Seneca Falls in 1848, this is a women's rights convention in which even former slave Frederick Douglass was there as well, promoting women's rights. And they issued the Declaration of Sentiments, the idea that all men and women are created equally. Free and enslaved blacks responded to their conditions in different ways by promoting by creating new family structures, especially for slaves, this idea of surrogate families. This could be a great short answer question. What were different ways that that enslaved blacks responded to their conditions. And, you know, because slaves were often 
traded and broken up and families were broken up, they developed surrogate or adopted families. Some became involved in abolitionism, like Frederick Douglass here. You have David Walker, who, uh, who wrote an appeal to the colored citizens of the world, which urged violent rebellion to end slavery. And he advocated African Americans to resist oppression. And you also have Nat Turner's rebellion in Virginia in 1831, which many whites and African Americans as a result were killed. All right, new technological innovations increase efficiency and extended markets. So we're going to talk about the market revolution. We have textile machines such as the spinning jenny, which increased production. By the way, all these all these inventions that I'm going to talk about here are specifically mentioned, so know them. Steam engines allowed boats to travel against the current, so this increased transportation. We have interchangeable parts by Eli Whitney. This allowed for the mass production of goods. There's our boy Eli there. He also invented the cotton gin. We have canals. The Erie Canal in particular connected places as far away as Chicago to New York City, and goods could be shipped further. Railroads really expand during the 1840s, and especially post Civil War, and this really hurts canals because you can ship them farther and faster. The telegraph helped lead to the spread of information. One of the first things spread through the telegraph was the nomination of James K. Polk at the 1844 Democratic Convention. And we have agricultural inventions as well, things like the mechanical reaper, which would harvest crops, and the steel plow, which would help break soil to grow more crops. Production of goods began to replace semi subsistence farming, and more and more people are moving outside of are moving from farms to the emergence of factories or at least building, creating things outside the home. And we see this in the Lowell system, these farmers' daughters that worked in factories in eight-hour shifts, and they lived in boarding houses, and they worked outside the home. This is really the movement to work outside of homes by creating things outside of homes. All right, let's talk about regional specialization. We have cotton. It was used in textile production in the Northeast. It depleted the land, which was a need for expansion, which will contribute to tensions between the North and the South. And the government tried to create a unified national economy, most notably through my boy Henry Clay's American system. Three parts, Bank of the United States, tariffs, which is a tax on foreign goods, and internal improvements, building of things like canals and infrastructure. And the idea is that these tariffs would pay for the internal improvements. However, the North and the Midwest were more closely linked than the South through the American system. There's the free and forced, specifically with slaves and Native Americans, migration of people across the, across the nation, across the continent, in part to gain natural resources. Again, cotton is depleting the land, so many slave owners in the South will move out West, forcing the their slaves to move with them and new labor systems begin to emerge most notably unions in 1837 with the massachusetts supreme court ruling commonwealth versus hunt which legalized labor unions so about the impact of the market revolution canals and roads helped encourage westward expansion made it much easier european immigrants settled in the it's very important there's two ty there's two people in particular you need to know that are coming from europe the Irish, which are suddenly settling in the East, and Midwest are German, Germans, and they're settling as farmers. So Irish tend to settle in cities. Germans tend to settle in Midwest, like areas like Ohio, Indiana, etc., as farmers. So why did they leave Europe? Well, there are economic hardships. The potato famine in Ireland in particular, there was not enough land and there was economic opportunities in the United States. This helped increase interdependence between the Northeast and the Old Northwest. It's a similar idea to, to the American system. It connects the Northeast and the Northwest more so than the South. These immigrants were not settling in the South in, in really any significant numbers. All right, the South remained distinctly different from the other regions. They relied heavily on cotton, and as time went on, they, they devoted more and more of their time and energy and resources to cotton. The market revolution changed life drastically by increasing the gap between the rich and the poor. We have the, a new middle and working classes emerging, and there's this, perhaps most importantly, the separation between home and the workplace. As I mentioned earlier, more goods were produced outside the home. The very, very, very beginning of factories, but I don't even like to use the word factories because it's not what we think of today. And they helped change gender and family roles. Again, going back to the Lowell girls. 
For many Americans, regional interests were more important than national concerns. We talked about that earlier, and this is seen through slavery. Tensions increased as time went on, and the South was more devoted to the South, and the North was more devoted to the North. We see this in the National Bank, the bus. It was disliked heavily in the South, and tariffs as well. So really, like Henry Clay's American system was not overall well-liked in the South. The tariffs tended to favor the North or manufacturing, and they were disliked in the South. And internal improvements, again, the third part of my boy's system, um, is the idea that tariffs would pay for the cost of this. And this was favored out West, where Henry Clay was from in Kentucky, because the infrastructure in Kentucky was nowhere near it was, for example, in New York. All right, let's talk about it, the U.S. increasing its presence in the Western Hemisphere. Post Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. participated in several initiatives in the Western Hemisphere and Asia. We have negotiating the Oregon border. James K. Polk was like, yo, bro, we're going to go 54-40 or fight on, on Britain here with this Oregon territory. And then they settle on the 49th parallel, which is essentially the same border between the U.S. and Canada. He wanted all of this region, and then they agree on the middle with no fight. We had the annexation of Texas in 1845. This helps lead to the Mexican-American War and, of course, tensions over slavery. And in 1823, John Quincy Adams, who is Secretary of State, writes the Monroe Doctrine, which is a message to Europe to stay out of the Western Hemisphere, and in return, the U.S. will stay out of European affairs. Great political cartoon. Very well could see that. Who knows? All right, let's talk about the effects of expansion. Every time the U.S. expands, the number one issue is going to be, is this going to be a slave area or a free area? And usually states were admitted in alternating fashion. We'll see this with the Missouri Compromise. There's resistance to increasing power of the federal government. We talked a little bit about this earlier, the Hartford Convention. These were Federalists who were upset with the War of 1812. Some of them urged secession. They felt that they had no voice in the federal government. The nullification crisis, same idea, but for the South. This was over tariffs. South Carolina nullified the tariffs of 1828 and 1830. To, they felt their voice was not being heard in the federal government. And that was written by Dracula, I mean John C. Calhoun here. And those living on the frontier advocated expansion, people like war hawks during the War of 1812. And the impacts were conflicts with natives, and Indian, which led to things like the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears. Admit it, he looks like Dracula, right? Okay, at least a vampire we can agree on. Okay, and here is the map of the Trail of Tears that many Native Americans took to go west of the Mississippi River. Okay, the Missouri Compromise, it's specifically mentioned, also known as the Compromise of 1820. Know all the parts. Three parts. One, every state, every area of land above 36 degrees 30 latitude would be free in the future. Everything below it would be slave. Missouri was added as a free state and Maine is added as a slave state, which keeps the balance equal at 12. Very important so that neither the North or the South, free or slave states, could gain an advantage in the Senate. Now, ironically here, here's that 3630 line. Missouri, most of it, except this little bit here, is above that 3630 line. But for example, according to the Louisiana Compromise, Everything here in green in the future would be free. Everything below would be slave. We'll see this compromise breaks down and is eventually overturned by the Kansas-Nebraska Act and Dred Scott, which we'll get into in the period five video. The overcultivation of land in the southeast, all this cotton that people are growing down here, leads to expansion and increase in tensions over slavery when we get to the Mexican-American War in the next time period. All right, we'll do a quick recap. Federalists and Democratic Republicans know them, as well as Whigs and Democrats. Second Great Awakening, if there's nothing else you know, it's they respired in form, reforms. What were different ways that slaves resisted their situations? Be familiar with many new technological inventions and the impacts. Market revolution and its impact. More goods were not made in the home. And old immigration, which are Germans and Irish, where did they settle? And holy cow, the Missouri Compromise. And I forgot to put up the American system in here. Put down the American system, too. All right, short answer practice. If you want to do this, answer all three parts. Briefly explain one government proposal to slavery between 1800 and 1850. Briefly explain one short-term effect of the proposal. Briefly explain one long-term effect of the proposal. Use the Compromise of 1820. All right, we will see you right back here for a period five and ten minutes, and we'll get into this dude, John Brown. I thank you guys for watching. If you found this video helpful, please hit the share button. Share it with friends, family, anybody who would benefit from this. Check out my other videos, and best of luck this year, especially in May when you're taking the exam. You're brilliant. You'll do great. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below, and I will get back to you.
have a good day.